May the words from my lips and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. I have a confession to make this morning. I have to admit that this was a tough sermon to write and maybe even harder to preach. I'm thinking of the author's words to the people of Ephesus, asking them to be thankful, to give thanks for both the good and the bad. You see, my friends, I'm not sure my faith is that strong. Then complicating things even more is that there's serious doubt that St. Paul ever wrote the letter. That it was penned by a later author who knew of Paul's teachings. So bear with me as I give it a go, as some of my English friends might say, and we'll just see how it turns out. But let's start with a question. If you had to leave your home with the probability of never returning, what would you take with you? That was the question residents of Greenville, California faced in July of 2021, hours before the Dixie Fire engulfed their community. After the fire, Greenville was utterly destroyed, blackened with ash and soot. The fire destroyed everything in its past and it was almost impossible to breathe. When the evacuation order came, the residents had just a few hours to decide what to take and what to leave behind. It was a scary time, as it would be for each of us. As the fire raged, two reporters from the Washington Post caught up with some of the evacuees and asked, what did you decide to take with you besides important documents and your medications? And why? Stephanie Fairbanks, age 33, took the ashes of her two deceased Labrador retrievers, Benny and Bob, and a few choice bottles of Cabernet Sauvignon from her extensive wine collection. She also took an old-fashioned mechanical wine opener Harvey Marino, age 43, an artist who made t-shirts, took all his sketchbooks and design ideas and the first t-shirt he ever designed. Brianna Angel, age 10, was given the job of rounding up the family cat. She succeeded, and an orange tabby named Brenda was saved from the ashes. She gave birth to kittens just a few months later. Teresa Hatch, age 61, carried out her Jack Russell Terrier, a few bags of clothes, and her rosary. She went on to say, taking that rosary helped her make sure Jesus was with her. And this is a question, my friends, of profound personal and spiritual importance. As many in this church and community found out during the Cedar Fire in 2003, and the Whip Creek Fire in 2007. We remember the pain of those days like it was yesterday. You see, disasters, my friends, have a way of sharply focusing our priorities in life, don't they? Just think of these words. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God for everything, everything. What else is new? You don't understand. My situation is different. Should we drop a text message to God expressing our frustration, our pain? I can see it now on X. Dear God, things are a holy mess down here. Why can't you just fix it? I've thought that myself. 
from time to time. Surely the author of Ephesians is engaging in a little sanctified exaggeration, maybe a little holy hyperbole. How are we ever, how do we ever give thanks at all times when in our human nature it's easier to complain and lament about the problems we have in life rather than offer thanksgiving. And I admit it's a subject I am often guilty of myself. And speaking of lamenting, there's a little story I'd like to tell you to go along with this. A new restaurant business was opening and one of the owner's friends wanted to send him some flowers for the occasion. When the flowers arrived at the new restaurant, the owner read the card. It said, rest in peace. <laughs> the new owner, as you would imagine, was quite angry. His food wasn't that bad. <laughs> and he called the florist to complain. After he had told the florist of the obvious mistake and how angry he was, the florist, the florist replied, sir, I'm really sorry for the mistake, but rather than getting angry, imagine this. Somewhere out there is a funeral taking place and they have flowers with a note saying, congratulations on your new location. You see, it's one thing to thank God for a promotion at work. It's quite another to be thankful for a pink slip. It's one thing to thank God for a family member who is helpful, cooperative, and a joy to be around. It's quite another to offer our thanksgiving for the black sheep of the family. You know the one. He shows up on Thanksgiving late for dinner and has a bag full of McDonald's saying, I don't eat turkey. <laughs> We've all been there. There are circumstances, my friends, when offering Thanksgiving doesn't come easy. I know that. The act of just saying, thank you, Lord, is the spiritual equivalent of doing hard labor. But here's a little secret. You don't necessarily need to feel thankful at that exact moment. It can wait a bit. It's like a parent saying to a child, I love you, when the little one has done something really bad and frustrated you half to death. Like drawing with Crayola crayons on your newly painted living room wall. Mid the punishment, this child of God, flesh of your flesh, turns to you with tear-filled cheeks and says, Mommy, do you still love me? Maybe you don't feel a whole lot of love at that moment, but you may just have a future Michelangelo on your hands. And remember this. It's as Norman Vincent Peale used to say, you can love completely without completely understanding why. Even when your new walls are the canvas for a four-year-old. You see, it's awfully hard to give thanks to God for those troubling medical test results, but it can be done, even if it does seem like a spiritual stretch. And why? Because even in our tumultuous and stressful world, God just leads us through the chaos and the noise of our lives. Through it all, my friends, we are beckoned to pay attention. And when we pay attention to God's word, it is like a gently flowing stream that brings us peace and hope. Now that's worth being thankful for. It's like one of my 90-year-old friends and parishioners, someone I was with just last night at the five o'clock service said to me, 
I'm thankful every morning if I can get up, put both feet on the floor, and remember what day it is. I can relate to that. No, my friends, giving thanks doesn't take our pain and struggles away, but it points us towards the light in times of darkness because we don't take this journey called life alone. Our family, friends, and the church walk with us. And then there is this, and we should ever, never forget it. Our Lord and Savior looks down on our lives and said, yes, remember those words from Genesis. It is good. It is good. I walk with you always. But now, maybe someday, consider offering this simple prayer or something like it. Lord, I don't know what you're doing with my life, but give me the faith to thank you for doing it anyway. Surely that fits within the definition of giving thanks for everything. I want to finish with one final story. There's a famous historical example of that kind of thanksgiving. It was uttered by Teresa of Avila, a spiritual leader and founder of the Carmelite order in the medieval church. One day, Teresa was out for a walk with several of her sisters when they happened to cross a small wooden footbridge. The bridge began to swing and sway, and before long, Teresa and his sisters found themselves standing knee-deep in the water, the frigid water, as that bridge gave away. Teresa, it is said, offered this prayer. Lord, I know you have promised never to give us more than we can handle, but sometimes I wish you didn't trust me so much. <laughs> now, that may not be, my friends, an out-and-out prayer of thanksgiving, but it comes from a thankful place. Give thanks always and for everything. That's a good model for all of us to follow today and always. And why? because it just may make us feel a little bit better. And for that alone, we can be thankful.